everyone this is Mel welcome back to the ebb and skate if you haven't already done so please like please subscribe please share this video and leave all your comments preferably respectable ones um, this is a positive environment here very positive so uh, today so one I of the things I wanted to discuss is as you know I'm a writer and um, there's been a lot of ongoing debate when it comes to um, writers who are not white or non-white writers. And the debate is to racialize versus not to racialize your characters. Non-white authors who are all about racializing or um, embracing their their characters non conformity identity so you know there are people who are like i am gay and uh, my characters are going to announce how gay they are <laughs> there are books that make it clear that from the title or the cover that this character is meant to be gay there are books that make it clear that these characters are black and i'm focusing more specifically on racialization as opposed to you know, um, sexual identity or um, gender identity or uh, or any any of that. More specifically, I'm focusing on racialization. What do I mean by that? So racialization is the application of certain traits and characteristics to your character based on their race or ethnicity. And this is a tricky thing to navigate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what you, this, is, this is a tricky thing to navigate because often it involves identifying your character's race and ensuring that the reader knows this is your character's race. It doesn't rely on subtlety. It, it relies heavily on just flat out announcing the race of your characters. Typically, white authors, when they do this, they will apply nuance to descriptions of white characters but then they will approach a character who's not meant to be white and they will flat out describe that character as a black woman an asian man and so forth this is racialization or otherization where the character's race is highlighted in a way that is not nuanced or subtle Many non-white authors do this, and many are in favor of it. The argument being that, or the defense of this being that, well, we want to make it perfectly clear that this is about black people, or this is about gay people, or this is about transgender people. So we're going to spell this out for you. And there are many people like myself who are not in favor of this. <laughs> I think it's just really a difference of what we are trying to achieve. Many people who do this, who embrace racialization, again, I'm using more specifically example of racialization as opposed to gender or sex, but many people who believe in racialization, they do it because their goal is ultimately to send a message. It's more activism. So it's, to, it's supposed to send a message to I guess the society at large, white supremacists, or to make it clear that this is about recognizing those who feel that they've not been included for a long time. And I recently saw a thread on Twitter where this was exactly brought up that the argument was that the reason why race and gender issues were dealt with allegorically in the past in say Star Trek and the reason for this was because this was the only way the showrunners and the writers could get away with it. This was the only way they could get away with addressing issues of race and gender and sex and class even without being cancelled or attacked. And to some extent this is correct. You know, science fiction allows you to get away with critiquing social structures and humanity 
while at the same time <laughs> um, not getting in trouble for it, getting into trouble for it. And I know there have been lots of arguments and debates about the problems with allegory, like many people don't get it. This goes back to numerous stuff I've mentioned in previous videos regarding Star Trek or the Steve Shivs video, why do conservatives like Star Trek? Because there seemed to be a mind-boggling kind of confusion going around about why is it that certain why is it that Star Trek attracts so many conservatives when from the get-go it seemed like it was a very woke or <laughs> very um, racially inclusive um, agenda-driven type of series? And the argument is that because the allegories are too subtle. So <laughs> I don't think it's because the allegories are too subtle. I mean, Although, to be fair, you know, there was a debate I took part in regarding the Drumhead uh, episode of TNG where it was obvious that, that myself and the conservatives were on a very different page about what the episode was about. Personhood versus, um, <laughs> you know, individual rights, for example. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, a bizarre kind of uh, moment. But to get back to the point, you know, the argument is that allegories will go over the heads of many people. And I'm not sure if that's true, but maybe it is. You know, people watch science fiction and other shows for entertainment. They don't watch it for critiques of society. So you will miss a lot of it. And I've missed a lot of things um, in some of my favorite shows, like Ghostbusters. Growing up, I had no idea Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters movie, was basically pro-Reaganism, <laughs> pro-capitalism. It was only later when you, you really pay attention that you pick up on these messages. So many things will go over people's heads. And, you know, there's an entire argument about the MCU with Captain America and Iron Man and, and even Captain Marvel being pro-military, pro-American imperialism, pro-police, pro-military, but again, this is not what this is about. <laughs> so I get the argument on many sides that allegory go, allegories will go over people's heads, and so sometimes you have to spell it out. But as I mentioned in my video on, um, my video on, on um, uh, black racialized horror, I am not really a fan of using science fiction in that way because I think it defeats what the purpose of science fiction is and it almost reads or it, it comes across as two different narratives that are not interwoven. It takes something away from the science fiction aspect of it. So in a sense, I'm arguing for um, allegory because I feel allegory is definitive of the genre. We alien cultures being used as stand-ins for human cultures is what science fiction is about. If human cultures are suddenly no longer being interwoven in a science fiction way, then really the science fiction aspect of it is lost because then the science fiction aspect of it just becomes nothing but a vehicle um, to send the message. The, I guess it loses something. It loses a sense of disbelief, a suspension of disbelief, so to speak. And there is nothing, and then what's the point of watching it when I can just watch a regular movie about the civil rights movement? Like, what's the point, and as I mentioned this again in my racialized horror video, what's the point of watching Antebellum when I can just watch 12 Years a Slave, since it's more or less the same movie? <laughs> and it's just, it's no longer science fiction. <laughs> It, it becomes very real and it loses that sense of maybe wonder is not the right word, but for me, that is ultimately what happens where there is a sense of wonder or a sense of, of a suspension of disbelief that disappears when you take away the allegorical aspect of it. And I also, you know, the, the other point of this is I don't believe in dumbing down narratives because people don't get it. <laughs> I don't believe that because someone doesn't get allegory that it means you should get away with allegory. Because again, it serves the purpose of using science fiction as nothing more than a vehicle 
to promote a real life agenda versus allowing science fiction to tell you a story. And I would prefer if my science fiction tells me a story. I would prefer if it explores the human condition through aliens and allegory, as opposed to, again, just using the genre as a vehicle or, you know, to, to, to send a message. And, you know, that's how I feel about it. But going back to the point of racialization, and, and if you haven't figured out how these things tie together, but racialization, again, ex basically spelling out the race of your character in a novel. I don't do this. I, but again, it's a difference of approaches. For many people who do this, the goal is to send a message. For someone like me, and I often quote Nnedi for the Nigerian-American author on this, because she's very good at explaining this, and you can read her essays on these topics and her various Twitter posts about calling people out for describing her work as an answer to white supremacy or a black version of. She doesn't like this. Because ultimately what it does is centers whiteness, you know, and it centers whiteness in a way that limits or or abnormalizes and otherizes non-whiteness. So this is even the reason I don't use phrases like people of color or persons of color, because I feel they otherize Non, people who are not of European heritage, people who are not white. But and to get back to the point of racialization, I think my approach to challenge white supremacy is basically to humanize people like me, people who are not white, which I think is the same approach Nadia Korfor takes, which is I am not obsessed with sending a message to white society or challenging whiteness or white supremacy, but rather I only care about telling stories about people who look like me and the way we live our lives because our lives are not, you know, our lives are not dictated by whiteness. It's not dictated by white supremacy, you know, and, and if you, I just recently saw again the second episode of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and there's a really good scene where the child tells calls uh, Sam Wilson the Black Falcon, <laughs> which is a call out of why is it that many superheroes who are black are often, they have the term black in their title, Black Goliath, Black Falcon. <laughs> okay, technically he was just a falcon, but he made a good point is, so he says to the kid, so you're the black kid, because you're a kid and black, so that makes you a black kid, or are you just a kid? You're just a kid. And this is this is part of why I don't racialize people, because this is what racialization is. It's calling attention to someone's race unnecessarily so, and what this does is it does in fact racialize people who are not white, because the only people who don't get their race called attention to our white people. So, you know, when you have characters who are described by, you know, having an aquiline nose or, you know, milky white skin or eyes of aqua, aquamarine or something, and then you go to the, the character who's supposed to be black and you just describe the character as the black person, that is racialization and what that does is otherize the person and makes the person's race the most important thing about that person as opposed to you know giving the person a nuanced description or describing the person in, in the same way so um in the same way that you describe your white characters and that is the approach i take so my characters are not and i think part of this is coming from a Caribbean culture, and Nnedi Okorafor is Nigerian-American. So in, in these kind, types of societies where people are more or less a racial monolith, there is really no reason to ascribe traits and qualities to a person based on race or skin color. So other things come into factor. I know in Africa, it's your tribe and it's your ethnic and cultural background that helps to define you. 
And in the case of Nadia Korafor, she called someone out on Twitter a while back for being surprised that all the characters in her novel Lagoon, which is a, a alien invasion story that takes place in Nigeria, that all the characters are black. Because apparently, despite the fact that it takes place in Nigeria and where all the characters have Nigerian names, eat Nigerian food, use Nigerian slangs and dialects, and go to Nigerian places, people were still shocked that the characters were black because they were never described as black. <laughs> And really, when you think about it, who does that? I don't wake up in the morning and go, Oh, I'm black. Look at me, I'm black. No one does that. But I understand, you know, in the United States, where there is a dominant white culture, the African Americans, that is to say black Americans, have been racialized. So they've been defined by race, which itself is very problematic, because what does that mean? <laughs> that there are certain things, certain traits, certain qualities that have been applied to them based solely on their the perception of their race, which ultimately doesn't say anything about who they are as people, as characters, as persons. It doesn't say anything about their likes and dislikes, although it attempts to define these things for them. Like, um, being of Caribbean heritage, when uh, my family first emigrated here, there was a shock because they were told, basically, if you don't listen to rap music, <laughs> you're not black. But growing up in the Caribbean, we have our own music. We have reggae, dancehall, calypso, soca, and those are our music. And those are music that are made by black people. <laughs> you know, if you've ever been to Carnival or Caribana, those are black people music because they were created by black people, but because they don't fit into, they're not hip hop, then they are dismissed as not being black <laughs> because this is the problem with racialization because a lot of it also is highly dependent on American uh, culture and more specifically African American culture which is used as the defining culture for all people who are of black African heritage. So even if those people from these from Africa for the Caribbean, even if we have our own culture, our own foods, our own everything, we are still expected to fall into the monolith of African American identity and which is defined by racialized things. <laughs> that like in hip hop, for example, and R&B, and even if that's not the music genre you grew up with, you are still expected to identify with that. And, and if you don't, then you're not black. <laughs> Sorry, Joe Biden, you know, <laughs> you're not black if you don't do this, you're not black if you don't do that, which is not the mentality that people from the Caribbean and Africa were raised with. We're not so but it's a white supremacist approach to people who are black. It's using white supremacy to define who they are based on superficial racial traits and qualities and likes and, and dislikes, which it ultimately has nothing to do with the reality of who we are as people and our characters. So I don't describe my characters as black because that's not the way I was raised and I don't wake up in the morning saying, oh, look at my black dad. You know, I used to have these arguments in school with white, often white guys who would tell me that black people call themselves the N-word all the time and I would say, which black people? Because in the Caribbean, <laughs> in Caribbean culture, the N-word pretty much doesn't exist unless they're intentionally copying African Americans, which is another form of racialization. So which black people? I don't call <laughs> all the black people I know, my friends, my family. I never call them the N-word. You make it seem like I grow, I wake up in the morning and I say, hey, my, my black, and brother, hey, my black and mother, I don't, I none of my black friends have ever called me the N word, and I've never called any of my black friends the N word, and I don't call my parents the N word. So, where is this coming from? You're watching too much American television. <laughs> that's what the problem is, and that to me is a lot of the problems um, represent the problem with racialization. Racialization is another means of dehumanizing people. It's a means of, it's an, it's, it exists within the white gaze and the white framework of otherizing people who are not white. I don't have color, you do. You have color. Everyone has color, including 
wait for it, white people. So if I feel that the only way, the only logical way to demand the humanity of people who are not white is to treat them the way they treat themselves and not the way that white supremacy defines them, which is racialized through racialization. You know, if white people of occup if white people occupy the position of normalcy, where they are normal, raceless, the best way to challenge that is to humanize people who are not white. And the way to do that is not to define them based on the white gaze, which is to say to racialize them. The best way to do that, for me anyway, is to treat them as if they're normal, which is to say normal. <laughs> normal mean not, not racially defining them. I don't racially define my characters because I don't racialize myself. And in my culture, we don't racialize each other. We don't call each other the black boy or the black girl, and we don't ascribe qualities and traits to ourselves based on perceptions of what we are supposed to or expected to be like, racially speaking. You know, and for me, you know my characters are black because of the food they eat, dialect, their cultures. Um, those are the things that define them. So if you are reading one of my stories and my characters are eating oxtail for dinner and my character's stepmother speaks to her in Jamaican slang and my character goes to, you know, cornrow her bushy hair and you don't pick up from that, that the character is black, then that's your misfortune and you are the one who needs to be educated and maybe challenge your own limited imagination. I am not going to educate you on that. You need to educate yourself. And, you know, that is what I think about racialization of characters. I say don't do it. I think the best way to challenge white supremacy is to humanize and de-racialize people who have been racialized, since racialization is in fact a white supremacy practice of identifying and otherizing people who are not white <laughs> and while maintaining whiteness as the standard human being, the raceless standard human being. So anyway, um, that's my take on racialization of characters. I don't do it. I will never, this is not to say you may not have a character in my story mention a person's darker skin, but I will never personally go out of my way to define my characters in stereotypical ways simply as a means of um, racializing them because I think, because I want to send a message. I actually don't want to send a message. I just want to write about people. People who happen to look like me and live like me and experience the culture that I've experienced that's all I want to do. And I don't want to write stories about white supremacy or the, the white gaze or to send a message to white people or white supremacy. So that's just how I feel about it. But anyway, let me know. Let me know how you feel about racialization of characters and if you are pro-racialization, whether it's using phrases like people of color or racially identifying your characters or even gender and, and sex identities as well, because those do count as a form of that. But let me know what you think and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And remember folks, be kind.